first video about um, animal form and function. And the first thing we're going to talk about is the endocrine system um, because it's a really good branching off point to go off of what we were talking about with plants about how they respond to external and internal stimuli. And the endocrine system in most mammals is um, a signal laden system. It's responsible for a lot of different signalings that keep that organism in homeostasis, takes care of all the processes of nutrition and keep that organism alive. Um, and so it is like plants, it kind of responsible for the, um, what am I trying to say? Feedback, the mechanisms feedback to maintain or to respond to stimuli, both internal and external. So this is going with chapter 32.1 through 32.3. And I'm going to throw a little extra about the kidney on the end to kind of hopefully clarify the last bit of the chapter. It's a lot more confusing in your book. So to first to start off, organisms are structured in a hierarchy of complexity. So just like eukaryotic cells have um, organelles that are each do a special function that keeps the cell alive, so too are organisms' bodies, our animals' bodies. They're grouped in a hierarchical nature, going down smaller and smaller groups of more and more specialized components. So for example, at an organism level is made up of smaller um, parts called organ systems, like the digestive, circulatory, respiratory, that all do a specific job to keep the organism alive. Inside that organ system, like the respiratory system, there are the lungs, which serve a specific function within the greater respiratory system, gas exchange. Inside the lungs, there's alveolar tissue, which are grouped together to form organs that are even more specialized. And then we have the most specialized individual cells within that tissue, within that organ, within that organ system, within that organism. So it's a pyramid where the most specialized part is at the bottom, at the cellular level. The endocrine system is just like this. It's a system or a collection of glands that secrete hormones, which are chemical signals that travel through the blood um, to all of your cells and elicit specific responses um, from target cells to help maintain homeostasis by responding to certain external or internal stimuli. So certain stimuli will cause the um, excretion or um, certain um, of these hormones to be produced. It'll travel through the blood to target cells where they will elicit a specific stimulus. Here is a picture of many of the different organs in the uh, endocrine system. Very numerous, some of the largest organs in your body like the, li like, uh, the pancreas and the um, adrenal glands, all part of the endocrine system. Hypothalamus, many um, neural organs, hypothalamus, the pituitary gland, things like that. So, like we said, it goes from most specialized to least specialized cells, tissues, organs, organ systems, and a whole organism. It's very important that animals regulate their internal and external environments to maintain homeostasis, just like plants. Animals are both what's called regulators and conformers. A regulator is an organism that can use internal mechanisms to prevent an external variable from changing their internal state. So for example, animals can use mechanisms to prevent the temperature outside from changing the temperature inside of our bodies. Warm-blooded animals can do that. So as far as temperature regulation, warm-blooded animals are regulators. However, cold-blooded animals, ectotherms, are conformers, or they allow their internal state to change in response to that external variable. Our internal, their internal state temperature changes because the temperature changes outside. The endocrine especially maintains homeostasis by sensing internal and external stimuli via sensors. There we have different internal and external sensors, like our sense of touch, external sensor, pituitary gland, internal sensor, releasing hormones that trigger a response from receptor cells that change the set point of a biological variable or the normal, the, the norm range. All right. 
What's really important is to this whole system maintaining homeostasis is positive and negative feedback. So signaling in the endocrine system and response to stimuli can be classified as either negative or positive feedback loops. And negative feedback loops are much more common or almost exclusive, except for a few um, examples that I'll show you in animals. Not a lot of positive feedback loops. For example, a negative feedback loop, the response of the signal, so certain stimuli has created a signal, the response to that signal, what a cell actually does, decreases or dampens the initial stimuli. So, for example, when you start to exercise, your body temperature increases. As a response to that increase in body temperature, your endocrine system uh, um, signals uh, sweat glands to start secreting sweat to cool your body by evaporative cooling. Right? So the response to that signal decreases the temperature, decreases the stimulus. That keeps us at an optimal range. That's an example of negative feedback. Another one is blood pressure. Stress elevates our blood pressure. Um, receptors sense the change in um, blood pressure and then decreases heart rate and increases blood vessel diameter. That response then decreases the stimuli, the high blood pressure. The blood pressure lowers and it returns to normal. Or if our blood pressure decreases beyond normal, those same receptors increase heart rate and decrease blood vessel diameter. This response dampens the stimulus, dampens the low blood pressure, or decreases the low blood pressure so it returns to normal. That's a negative feedback, decreasing or dampening the initial response. Positive feedback mechanisms are just the opposite, where the response to a signal serves to amplify the signal or increase its strength. That would be if a decrease in blood pressure caused um, our endocrine system to decrease blood pressure even further, but that wouldn't be good. One real life example is when a baby is growing in the womb, at a certain point when it's taken up the whole uterus, it activates stretch receptors in the uterus. This signals the brain to release oxytocin. That oxytocin causes the uterine muscles to start contract. The contractions op then synergize or activate even further the stretch receptors. So it's a runaway circle that keeps amplifying and amplifying until the baby is born and delivered. This is one example of positive feedback, but it's pretty rare in um, biological systems because that runaway train analogy doesn't really help maintain homeostasis or that balance. A good regulation though is thermoregulation, an animal's ability to maintain their body temperature in a critical range. Warm-blooded organisms or endotherms use heat accumulation from biological reactions in our bodies so the digestion of food to maintain our temperature where cold-blooded animals must use the environment to do this. So they rely on heat radiated from the sun or conducted through a warm stone into their body that they're sitting on or convection from a uh, rising and falling atmospheric heat. Um, some different things that warm-blooded individuals use is insulation, so fat or hair like on um, mammals, feathers in birds, uh, evaporation through sweat, Radiation through, you know, just your body radiates heat. Uh, conduction, passing it off to your surroundings. And something that's called the countercurrent exchange. So warm blood that's pumped through our arteries is a lot warmer than the blood in our veins. Why your veins and your arteries are so close together is heat exchange can occur between the warm arteries and the cool veins, helping to maintain the temperature equally between the two. This is an example of thermoregulation and how warm-blooded organisms do that. Cold-blooded organisms usually don't have um, this closed circulatory system um, that allows for this type of heat exchange. In addition, the hypothalamus in the brain controls many responses in the body to maintain body temperature via um, endocrine signaling. So, for example, 
our body temperature is normally 36 to 38 degrees. If our body temperature starts to increase, the thermostat or the temperature regulator in our hypothalamus will start to signal uh, that our body needs to cool down. It'll signal our sweat glands to secrete sweat and our blood vessels to dilate to get bigger so that they can evaporate or they can um, um, conduct and convect away more heat. And because of those two things, our body temperature decreases. And as it decreases, this thermostat, the hypothalamus, switch stops sending those signals. So um, it can return to a normal range. Once our body temperature decreases, though, the hypothalamus causes our blood vessels to constrict and our skeletal muscles to start contract and shivering to be generated, which increases the body temperature. Once it's increased above a certain threshold, that thermostat, that hypothalamus, will switch off those responses and our homeostatic temperature of 36 to 38 will um, be maintained. So the endocrine signaling triggers many homeostatic me mechanisms. So endocrine glands secrete signaling hormones to all cells in the body, but only cells with specific receptors respond to a given hormone's release. So only cells that um, have a specific receptor will respond to that hormone in the blood, even though the blood is sending that hormone to all the cells in your body. The nervous system, if you think about it, also is a much the same way, and we'll talk more about the nervous system next. Um, in fact, the endocrine and the nervous system often function together in signaling. It's called the, en the neuroendocrine signaling uh, system. The endocrine system can operate in isolation to maintain homeostasis without the nervous system. For example, um, if there's a low pH in the duodenum, so um, the duodenum is the proximal part of your small intestine that's right attached to the bottom of your stomach, Right after you've eaten um, some food and we have gastric emptying, so your stomach opens up in the duodenum, um, a lot of that hydrochloric acid decreases rapidly the pH in the duodenum, but we don't want that acid to wreak havoc on that tissue. So in response, the S cells of the duodenum start to secrete a hormone called secretin. That secretin travels into the blood and uh, tar receptors on the target cells in the pancreas receive that signal. Once it receives that signal, bicarbonate, a base, is released into the duodenum, which decreases the pH um, and prevents the pH from going any higher. And once the pH is decreased, secretin stops being secreted which then stops activating pancreatic target cells, which then stops secreting bicarbonate. So it's a perfect example of negative feedback in the uh, endocrine, um, sole endocrine pathway. However, we can mix in the uh, neural uh, pathway as well. We can mix in um, some neuroanatomy too. So, for example, um, when babies start to suckle um, and to breastfeed, um, that suckling mechanical stem sensation stimulates sensory neurons or sensory nerves. These send that uh, signal to the hypothalamus, and in particular, the posterior pituitary, a small gland um, right below the hypothalamus, which secretes um, a neurohormone called oxytocin. This oxytocin travels to target cells in um, smooth muscles in the breasts, which then elicit the response of milk release. That milk release, though, more milk will create the, the baby, will cause the baby to suckle more, which will intensify this whole cascade, which intensify the secretion of milk. So this is a positive feedback mechanism. Most of the roles, not all, but most of the roles of oxytocin are in positive feedback mechanisms like this. Um, hormones, though, some hormones can have multiple effects. Sometimes one hormone can elicit several different responses depending on what cell type it activates. This is due to the fact that um, each cell type has slightly different receptors 
but those receptors are in a close enough to be activated or elicit response from the same hormone. Epinephrine is an example. So, for example, in skeletal muscles, epinephrine um, binds to beta receptors, beta adrenergic receptors, to cause vasodilation. However, epinephrine can also bind to alpha adrenergic receptors in intestinal blood vessels and cause them to constrict. Same hormone, different response. All right. However, epinephrine can also um, bind to beta adrenergic receptors in glycogen deposited cells and cause glycogen breakdown in liver cells. Different cellular responses, different tissues. All right. Second and last thing, um, one of the other examples I want to talk about is osmoregulation. So an animal needs to maintain water balance or osmoregularity. And osmolarity is just remember the moles of solid divided by the laser of solution from chemistry. So maintaining our water balance because um, not all organisms are able or can, or can survive to have the same osmoregularity as their outside environment. Osmoregulators are able to keep their osmolarity like humans at a different state than the environment. So salt, water, fish, and land animals, we have a different concentration of water inside our cells than outside in our environment. A good example in uh, marine or saltwater fish is gain of water and salt ions from food and gain of water and salt ions from drinking salt water create a, a high concentration of salt and water on the inside of the cell. And once that gets high enough, excretion of salt ions um, from gills and loss of water through gill slits kind of balance out that gain as well as excretion of some of those salts and water from urine. So this inflow and outflow of water and um, salt is balanced by these different mechanisms. In freshwater fish, the gain of water and some ions from food is accompanied by um, the uptake of salt ions um, through the gills and water gain through the gills. And these mechanisms are balanced by the excretion of salt ions and large amount of water um, from the urine. So osmoregulation, balancing the water intake and outflow and keeping our internal environment um, at a different regulate, uh, osmo -regu osmolarity than the outside. And one of the ways animals do that is in the kidney. And the kidney is fascinating. Um, I took a graduate, um, a, not a graduate, but a medical class um, specifically on nephrology, um, and it's very exciting. So proteins that are broken down in the body from digestion are turned into um, ammonia, and ammonia is pretty toxic for most cells. So what does your body do? It turns it into urea, which is less toxic. This caught takes energy. It's still kind of toxic, so it also has to dilute it with water. So that's when you urinate, water comes out too. is because it's to dilute that urea that's still kind of toxic. Antidiuretic hormone is a hormone that is secreted in your uh, kidney to tell your kidney how much water to take up, um, absorb, or to let go in your urine. So we have um, the blood being filtered and we're reabsorbing a lot of salts and getting rid of a lot of waste like ammonia and uptaking water through aquaporins in our, these uh, tubes, or these collecting ducts in our kidney. And if you're very dehydrated, um, antidiuretic hormone will be secreted in large amounts to absorb a bunch of this water. That's why your urine will be very concentrated, lots of urea, it'll smell really bad, it'll be really, really dark orange or, or kind of amber color. Also, if you have really low blood pressure, like losing a lot of blood or, or, or things like that, antidiuretic hormone will also cause you to keep more water through these aquaporins and, and raise your blood pressure. Um, so the kidney is an awesome, awesome thing. Awesome, awesome regulator of um, water, uh, osmoregulator in humans due to antidiuretic hormone and just the nature of, of nephrology. If, if you want to talk about this, I'll talk more with it about you. The, the kidney is fascinating. Um, just 
not a lot of depth required for, for the AP test, more as far as its regulation of osmolate regularity. Um, also, your <laughs> kidney um, through the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system regulates blood pressure. So, for example, um, if what's in what this section right here of your kidney is called is um, the uh, like the capsule, so the juxtamedullary apparatus, if it senses um, high blood pressure, uh, so blood is diffusing through here really strongly, lots of filtrate, um, your liver in response will um, secrete angiotensin and your um, juxtamedullary apparatus will secrete renin and that renin will turn the angiotensin secreted by our liver just normally to angiotensin 1. Angiotensin conversion enzyme will then turn it to angiotensin 2. This signals your adrenal gland to produce aldosterone which then um, increases sodium and water reabsorption and raises your blood pressure. And angiotensin II also increases arterial constriction um, to raise the blood pressure. So if your juxtamedullary apparatus senses low blood pressure, secretes renin, which activates the angiotensinogen that's just um, normally at, at low levels in your blood, it'll convert them in angiotensin sin, sin 1 and 2, which will affect your adrenal glands, creating aldosterone to um, reabsorb more water and to constrict your arterioles. All right, I know that is a lot. We're going to talk a lot more, especially about the kidney here next time, but if you have any dire questions, please let me know.